I'm delighted to welcome so many of you here to the centre today for this event, for braving the cold as well. We're very happy to see you all. I hope you enjoyed the video. It's a, it's a tiny soupçon of a taste of what we do at the centre currently. Let me add a little bit to that. The centre, as many of you already know, and its cadre of world-class experts, works across the entire range of development issues, aid, trade, migration, health, education, finance, climate, gender, many more. We research problems or inefficiencies and injustices. We look at theory and we look at evidence and we come up with new solutions, new ideas, which we then work to turn into action through policy change. We've been pretty successful over the years, whether it's development impact bonds or advanced market commitments for vaccines, helping to reduce global rice prices or helping to create a way to monitor deforestation in almost real time. Those are some of the things that CGD has achieved in its first 15 years, because this, 2016, is our 15th anniversary year, as our very sophisticated logo hints at. I hope that wasn't too subtle for you. Uh, so all year we will be celebrating. Already on our website, you can read about a new institution called IDSI, the International Development a Decision Support Initiative. It started out in the petri dish of a CGD working group and is now helping developing countries make better decisions about how to allocate their strained health budgets. In fact, it just got a big grant to scale up its work from Asia into Sub-Saharan Africa and beyond. And soon on our website, Scott Morris will be recalling how CGD helped the Asian Development Bank increase its lending capacity by billions of dollars. And he'll be looking forward to new work on the future of multilateral development banking. Today is also a part of our celebrations of our 15th anniversary. This is the first in our special Development Leaders series of events. And we're delighted that we have such a high caliber of speakers to join us today. Dr. Raj Shah stepped down as administrator of USAID almost exactly one year ago after five very successful years in post under President Obama. He's also now a distinguished fellow at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University here in DC. Michael Gerson served under President George W. Bush, a speechwriter and assistant for policy and strategic planning. You also, of course, know him as a columnist for the Washington Post. And leading them in conversation is Nancy Birdsall, CGD's founding president, who has steered us these first 15 years and who has chosen this year as the right time to step down as president although she will stay with us as a senior fellow to continue her passion for research. So Nancy will take over shortly, and after the conversation, I'll be back to moderate questions from all of you. And so for the reasons I've outlined today, it's a bit of a celebration today for many of those reasons. And I ask you now to welcome all our panelists, and we'll get on with the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raj, and thank you to uh, Raj and Michael for joining us today. Uh, what I'm going to do is, the two of them have written a piece in a, a, a book that is called Moneyball. Moneyball, uh, the, the theme of the book is clearly one of using data and evidence to do better and get results, and their essay has that quality about it, for sure. They emphasize how data and evidence have been used in US foreign assistance programs across the two administrations with which each of them worked. So I'm going to ask them a few questions that kind of arise from what they talked about in this Moneyball article. And then I thought I'd go on to ask them a little bit about their views of their own legacies when they were in power. And what next? What would be their recommendations in the area of development and particularly foreign assistance for the next administration? So I'm going to start with Raj. Uh, the article is very uh, compelling about the fundamental point of aid, or what it should be that it should not be about leveraging diplomatic and security problems. It should be about getting results on the ground, about saving and improving people's lives. And that's very interesting because, of course, one of the things that, from our point of view at CGD, has plagued USAID over many decades now is that it's deeply embedded in a system in the US architecture 
where security and diplomatic imperatives also impose on it either constraints or specific demands that may not be fully consistent. So this article is far more revolutionary and radical, frankly, than it's, it's sort of hiding behind the need for results, which sounds very wonky. But in fact, it's proposing a real revolution, kind of like the revolution that Claire Short brought to the British government now 20 years ago, and that has created an aid agency in the UK, DFID, which is considered far more effective than USAID has been. So with that long uh, diversion, maybe, from talking to you, Raj, tell us a little bit about how you came to this radical conclusion. And what, what were the frustrations, maybe some examples. I was thinking of Pakistan, for example. Uh, that led you to the theme that you set out in, with Michael in this essay. Well, thank you, and uh, let me just welcome everyone here, and thanks for uh, really such an extraordinary turnout. As I look around the room, I see so many leaders from development and global health uh, in Washington across administrations, and uh, it's just awesome that we all get to be together this morning, so, so thank you. And I'm very grateful to be with Mike, who together with Clay and so many others here, did extraordinary things in the Bush administration to, in, this, in the spirit of what you just mentioned, Nancy, of, of making sure people recognize that our investments in foreign assistance around the world should genuinely be about delivering a core result. And that core result should reflect our, our moral and strategic purpose to end poverty and protect those who would otherwise die of simple diseases and to create and expand the reach of human opportunity. Uh, I want to congratulate you. I, this is the first time I've been in public with you since you've announced your transition. And uh, you asked that question as if it was some new revolutionary concept <laughs> that development should be about results against poverty. And you've dedicated your life to that concept. And you've done it with uh, just an extraordinary sense of uh, purpose and intellectual rigor. And, you set a great example for a lot of folks in this room, including myself. And so thank, thank you, you and congratulations. Uh, I guess I will take a huge issue with one comment, which is, uh, and I, this won't surprise anyone, I'm still as competitive as I was a year ago. Uh, I, I, I just don't think it's true uh, that the United States is somehow behind other countries when it comes to repurposing our foreign assistance to be about the fight to end extreme poverty. Without question, uh, in my view, the greatest legacy I got to be a part of is not mine. It is one that was started by, by Mike and President Bush. It's one that um, you fought for for a long time. It's one that the world came together to announce as a collective mission this past September. Uh, but I have gotten through the past two decades of professional work to be a part of a movement to end extreme poverty. And that movement has become, uh, originally started as a slogan, you know, with a, a broad aspiration. Uh, I commend what Claire Short did at DFID decades ago, but that was a long time ago. And uh, today we have a much more purposeful sense of how we can go about making investments that genuinely end extreme poverty. Today, uh, the billions of dollars that President Bush uh, accelerated in global development investments and global health helped to make a huge impact on reductions in HIV and malaria prevalence and incidence, save millions of lives, changed the trajectory for many economies. Uh, I would argue the same kind of significant impacts from President Obama's major efforts in Feed the Future, in expanding our foreign assistance, and in transforming the purpose of USAID and other federal agencies to be about alleviating constraints to growth and ending extreme poverty. And I just got back last week from a trip to London, Norway, and Sweden. Uh, all of those institutions, despite having real challenges that they're facing right now with refugees and uh, downward pressure on their aid budgets, uh, are, are fundamentally really purposed around the goal of ending extreme poverty. And I think that's important because if you don't have a goal, if you don't have a sense of mission or a sense of purpose, 
then you can't really be about results. The, the focus on results, the focus on bringing data and evidence to deliver results against a goal has to be about some outcome that ultimately changes the global landscape and improves our sense of safety and security, improves our moral connectivity to the rest of the world, and creates re real economic opportunities. So the chapter that Mike and I uh, worked on and tried to write in the book is really a, hopefully offer some thoughts on how and some lessons we've learned uh, and some tough experiences we've had in trying to repurpose our aid to Pakistan, trying to grapple with our assistance to Egypt, trying to look at how $22 billion in the US aid portfolio can shift to a more public-private, private investment mindset to deliver big wins against the power deficits that hold countries back and keep people in poverty, or deliver big wins in expanding the reach of modern agricultural production to move people out of a condition of chronic and persistent and debilitating hunger. And I think we've had some big successes, but the real challenges will take place over the next 15 years as we work together as a community to end extreme poverty. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Thanks, Raj. It reminds me, let's hold up the book that I was supposed to t say that Results for America is making it available for download for free on Amazon. So if you want to read this revolutionary essay, that's how you can get it later today. Um, so Michael, um, one of the features in terms of results, obviously, in the essay is PEPFAR. Mm -hmm. And I wanted you to say a little bit about PEPFAR. Let me ask specifically. It's featured in the essay as an outstanding bipartisan uh, movement as well as program. Um, so I had a couple of questions. One is, how important to the success of PEPFAR? You emphasize here with Raj the results orientation, and I want to go back to that in a minute. But how important to this success was the president's personal attention and interest over a sustained period of time? Which I would say, you know, if, to the extent it mattered, it wasn't, it's more than having a cabinet level right. person in, uh, responsible for development, which we haven't had ever in this country, I guess. Uh, it's even more than that in terms of how much it might matter. So tell us a little bit about that. I'm happy to do that. I'm, I'm, let me just start by saying, though, I'm really honored to be with Raj as well here. Um, I, you know, I was an advocate for these issues on White House staff, and, uh, but Raj was really an implementer of some extraordinary accomplishments I mean, re and will be seen as one of the best at his job. Um, you know, very popular on both sides of the aisle on, on Capitol Hill. Um, and. I think it took uh, the logical next steps of American policy when it came to agricultural productivity, returning to an emphasis on those issues, uh, energy generation, which is what Africans talk about. Yeah, when you we're going to come about, back. Yeah, Don't worry, we'll them. come back to those. Um, and uh, you know, moving beyond emergency uh, global health initiatives to next steps initiatives when it comes to development, long-term development. And so I, I really admire uh, Raj's work, both as a, uniquely as a thinker and an implementer of these ideas and uh, the legacy that he had. Uh, PEPFAR, um, you know, we, um, we engaged in a foreign, a fa a, you know, foreign assistance reform process, internal reform process over the course of our administration. Um, that was housed at the State Department, that was uh, looking at change in the way we did aid more broadly, um, and it didn't work very well. Um, and there were too many equities, and you know, across the, you were, had to make enemies across the government, you had to make enemies with the Congress at a time when we were getting aid for Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, the Secretary of State didn't want those fights. It's a very tough thing to do foreign assistance reform because of how broadly those equities exist. Um, but I think what we did with PEPFAR and uh, PMI and MCC um, amounted to ad hoc foreign assistance reform. 
and we did it through presidential initiatives. People are sometimes critical of these you know, vertical programs. This was the way that we could set numeric goals, put someone in charge, give them massive resources that they needed in focused countries, um, and make measurable results that we could show to Congress and get a lot of money. Okay. Those are the basics of foreign assistance reform. Um, and they, uh, you know, President Bush had a real interest in that. He always talked about aligning authority, resources, and responsibility. That was his management theory. I think it's good foreign assistance reform. His instincts fit the needs of these uh, massive kind of presidential initiatives and programs. And I saw the dynamic by which our ambassadors uh, in those countries, who are very important to the implementation of these kind of programs, felt like they were being judged on the outcome, um, which was also quite important. Um, I, I, it also united efforts that had not been united before. I remember being in South Africa not long after the announcement of PEPFAR, um, being with someone that worked at USAID, who I will tell you was not a fan of George W. Bush politically, um, which was not unusual. Um, but uh, uh, when I talked with her at, at dinner, um, she was working with CDC in a way that she had never worked before. Um, there was a coordinated all-of-government effort that, that the ambassador was engaged in. And her words to me were, this is what I've always wanted to do with my life. Um, and I, so I think it can make that kind of difference when the president is engaged in that way. Um, you know, I, my best experience in government, sitting in the Oval Office, watching the president of the United States in the process of making the decision to pursue the largest initiative to fight a single disease in human history. Um, he was very focused on, will this work? He was not at all focused on, should we do this? He had already made that decision internally. And it was both a conception of America, a belief in human, universal human rights and dignity, and also now just a perception of what was possible. We had, um, you know, a shift was taking place towards uh, treatment, um, which had, there had been a lot of skepticism about treatment mm -hmm. before Durban. Um, and so there was a shift taking place. The prices of drugs were being reduced significantly. Um, and, um, and, but ultimately it comes down to a meeting in a room around a coffee table. Um, and, and, you know, I'll give you just one um, vignette from that decision. I'll stop. Um, but we, you know, he went through the black briefing book and we talked about a lot of details and how, you know, treatment would go the last mile and, you know, with bicycles and motorbikes. And he had, it, it was really detailed what, had, what um, Mark Dybul and Tony Fauci put together uh, as far as the, as the briefing. Um, but there was a moment when uh, Condi Rice talked about her mother being diagnosed with cancer when she was a young girl and living until she was an adult on treatment. And, said, and she said in that meeting, meaning, those years meant so much to me with my mother, and they would mean something to every <laughs> child who uh, lives to, you know, with their parents due to this program. Um, and it impressed the president, it impressed everyone there. Um, and it, so it really was, it was a presidential initiative driven down um, you know, with a new theory of how we were going to approach this that really fit his approach to government and I think an effective approach to aid reform. So. Right. Thank you very much from both of you. I think you can all feel sort of the combination of passion and rigor in, in the answers that is reflected in the, in the essay. Um, let me follow up with a sort of, again, playing a little bit the skeptic and devil's advocate. To what extent, and let's do it, you know, it's very interesting in the essay, the emphasis on health. There is a little bit of discussion of R&D for agriculture, very important. Uh, but health is an area where you can get results. And in, in the case of the HIV AIDS problem, the focus was on treatment targets initially. Now, of course, what happened with PEPFAR is eventually it became more and more clear that it needed to address system problems in the health sector. So I wonder if each of you would just say something about how does the outside community concerned with saving and improving people's lives help 
those of you, when you're inside, who are doing successful initiatives, to institutionalize them, to make them sort of stick in the system so that there is a legacy, both in terms of your passion and your ideas about using evidence and results that extends beyond particular people like President Bush, like Raj, who brought, obviously, a lot of expertise and a lot of thinking about health in particular, and then agriculture as well, to uh, being the administrator. Anything you want to say about that? Thinking forward a little bit. How do we get Raj and Michael, Bush, Condi Rice, view of the world institutionalized? Uh, well, Mike, Mike will have some comments on this, I'm sure. Uh, I, I would just say three things. First, it's important everyone understands that fully 25% or more of American foreign assistance is in health. That's in part due to the gentleman to my right, but uh, it's just the reality of where we are. The United States spends more than $8 billion a year on global health, way above what any other country does. The, the things we say, the ideas we put forward, the behavior we demonstrate in implementation of that set of programs defines the intellectual landscape in this space. If I can interrupt, my colleague Scott Morris has made the point in a publication <coughs> that the U.S. puts more into uh, its health programs every year than it does into the soft window, the concessional window, the IDA window at the World Bank. Right. Oh, much more. <laughs> and and uh, that's absolutely true. And so we have a responsibility, and we talk about the politics of, I think that will always be true. Uh, and I think the answer isn't to shift the money into other windows, but to do this well and to continue to get more of it. But nevertheless, uh, I made the case in government that I felt we were underperforming across that portfolio of $8 billion. Now, you know, in the chapter, Mike talks about the extraordinary results we've seen. Um, and so it's important to always push ourselves to do better. But in my mind, the underperformance was not so much that we weren't delivering disease-specific results that were off the charts, because we were, and it was making a huge difference, uh, but that we weren't doing enough to go after the low-hanging fruit, in, in this case of child survival. And so we launched a major effort to say, how do we use this existing portfolio of investment to do a better job at saving children's lives under five? How do we bring the, uh, the data-driven mindset that we write about in the chapter. And we pulled everyone together around the world. We came up with five core areas of investment that are the most cost-effective way of reducing child deaths in country after country. We looked at the 24 countries where America concentrates it, its child survival investment, and we reprogrammed a significant amount of the two, three billion dollars a year that goes into that investment bucket to do a better job of saving lives and to do a better job of measuring uh, outcomes related to under five child deaths. The fact that there's still six and a half million children that die every year under five is unconscionable. It should be far, it should be 500,000 or lower, and it could be in, in 15 years. I think we have enough money in the system to accomplish that outcome if we were smarter about it and we put more money into nutrition, put more into helping mothers at the point of childbirth and taking care of infants in that first 48 hours of life, if we put more into uh, the, the core drivers of excess child mortality like malaria and some of the other, and pneumonia and diarrhea, and if we did a better job of using basic science to understand and, and uh, recalibrate programming. So anyway, I, I say that because the second point is I think we were really trying to move in that direction, and that has now the chance to be institutionalized in some legislation that Chris Coons and others have sponsored uh, Mark Shriver's done an extraordinary job with Save the Children in pushing that concept forward, that it should be part of the American mission in foreign <laughs> policy to end under five child deaths around the world, and it should be codified in legislation. Final thing I'll say is just the Ebola crisis and now Zika, to me, have highlighted the huge gap in the system. Uh, I just concluded service on Ban Ki-moon's pandemic threats panel. And the reality is, I do not think we are better prepared today than we were 
two years ago to tackle an Ebola-like crisis. That's, that's frightening. And I, I was in Liberia this summer, and you ask simple questions. How many kids are immunized in your country? And you get 14 different answers depending on who you ask. Alex spent a lot of his time doing this. If you, if you look at even the way we collect data on something as simple as childhood immunization, they, you know, the UNICEF system for collecting that data, you know, quite frankly, is so antiquated. You're, you have local health officers asking people you know, roughly what quartile of coverage do you think exists in this district of this country? Then they take these nebulous guesstimates and crunch it so many times that you spit out a number like 66.3 that looks precise, but it's sitting on a mountain of nonsense. And you couldn't possibly implement the vision of this chapter and, and what, what was done in HIV and other areas if you're playing pretend with the data. So, you know, to me, in a $35 billion aid budget, 24 or 5 or 6 of it is uh, bilateral, the idea that we invest so little in data is, is striking to me. Alex Thier is here. We, we had an effort to move, what was the percentage, 3% of the budget in our early, do you remember the number? Oh, yeah. and, into M&E and, and results measurement, 3%. And what were we, what did, when we did our assessment, where were we? Yeah, and you know, and people were like, "Well, you're never going to get to three percent." I'm like, "Why could you never get to three percent? You should spend three percent collecting data so you know what you're doing with the other ninety-seven percent." Yet the mindset in this field is, "Oh my gosh, that's a lot of money on uh, on data. You know, that's a lot of money on collecting evidence, and we should be using every penny to save lives." This is saving lives. This is letting you be smarter about saving lives, and. Uh, Anyway, there's okay. a lot to do still so, going ahead. <laughs> so let me jump before we have more, you know, we don't want it to turn into a puff piece event here on <laughs> everything good about <clears throat> what the U.S. was doing. Let, but let me be a little puffy on what I think of as your legacy, Raj, and then ask Michael to comment on it. So I think of it as in three areas. First, uh, data evidence, openness, kind of modernizing, transparency, a lot of what you were just saying, which is what tempted me to jump to your legacy. That's one. Second, autonomy, more autonomy for USAID inside the State Department uh, with the push to get budget and policy capacity back into the heart of the USAID system. Um, that's a little bit more about medium term systems, you know, at least within the US government. And third, um, how to crowd in the private sector with the Feed the Future approach and, of course, Power Africa that you mentioned. So I was thinking as you were talking, um, how does this relate, you know, the USAID and actually the entire foreign assistance program of the US, with, with the possible exception of MCC, is very focused on health, mm -hmm. as you said. The Congress likes it. The American taxpayers like it. Uh, should we think, if we step back for a minute, and you heard that we're doing a lot of work on multilateral, the future of multilateral banking, should we have a system in which we say the US and its foreign assistance program has a clear advantage on humanitarian issues, immediate response on health, maybe on education that hasn't been quite as well developed yet, but where you certainly could measure outcomes in terms of what children, whether children are learning and what they're learning. Should we think of that, you know, think of the world we face, those of us who are not embedded in the US system, as making sense in that way? Have the US stop with the roads and the customs and ta tax administration and the many, many other things that are done through USAID and MCC to some extent, um, concentrate on areas like health, education, and agriculture where you want to have a science base, you want to have evidence, you can measure outcomes. Leave to the multilateral banks and to other donors institution building kind of hard stuff where you can't easily measure results, where you have to have a longer term vision. Michael. Tell me what you think of that. Coming out of President Bush's incredible experience, really, with 
bringing along the Congress, the American people, uh, on this extraordinary accomplishment. Well, we clearly continent. do have some comparative advantages um, when it comes to health. I was in Tanzania not too long ago, and just, it's a good example, that embassy, two-thirds of their spending is health at, that, at the Tanzania embassy. And two-thirds of that is PEPFAR. Um, our presence in Tanzania is largely a health presence. Um, we chose that not so much out of a strategic um, construct. Um, we weren't saying the Chinese are have this role and we're going to pursue this role. It was in response to a global emergency and then to a long-term challenge like malaria. Um, and it, um, it worked that way. Um, I actually think it works pretty well. I think that's a good face of America in the world. Um, I think in Tanzania, you know, people appreciate um, and know the words PEPFAR. They know PMI. They know Gavi as an international institution, mm -hmm. which has done just extraordinary work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's you know, more done together. Um, so I don't have any problem with the, you know, the U.S. having a comparative advantage and then actually cooperating uh, across international institutions and other bilateral programs, which, you know, in these programs to, to say, you know, we, uh, we do this better, you do this better. Mm -hmm. I think that's a goal. That's a good goal. Um, I think it's a very hard one, uh, and I don't think we're kind of close to it. Um, I don't think we do it across the U.S. government effort um, in comparative advantages sometimes. Um, you know, we have uh, development functions across the gov U.S. government, and they're not always coordinated. Um, I'll give you just one example. Um, it, this is not on a development issue, but, uh, or maybe it is. Um, but I remember, along with Elliot Abrams at the National Security Council, we requested uh, a, a study of sorts on U.S. spending on democracy promotion. Okay, mm -hmm. we just wanted to know who does it, where, how much? what, how much, you know, whatever. Um, it took, I think, close to a year to get any any product, and then when you went through it, even just a, a you know, thumbing through it, a lot of it was just put in the category of democracy promotion, it had nothing to do really with core functions of democracy promotion. Um, it was a confused mess. Um, and this is one of the core foreign policy objectives of the Bush administration, okay, was democracy promotion. This is the second inaugural address. This is, you know, Bush's foreign policy legacy. And it was very hard to get it to cohere in, in, in those structures. Um, and um, uh, so I, I think the goal is a worthy one. I'd like to see it across our government. I'd like to see it with our international part, multilateral partners, and I'd like to see it with other countries. Um, but we're very, very far from ha the goal. Our goal in our reform process, by the way, was to have single country plans, right? Which is what we moved towards in PEPFAR, which was very effective. Single country plan, where you work with the local uh, you know, the government, you come up with a coordinated across, you know, government plan, um, theirs and ours. And, you know, the goal was to have single country plans by which we're moving countries from one category of need uh, mm -hmm. to other categories of need instead of just, you know, funding a bunch of earmarks or funding a bunch of existing programs mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. hoping that you get an outcome. And that is what I proved to be very difficult very in difficult. our current Because of the pre-existing right, exactly. arrangements and yeah. earmarks. Nancy, right. can I, Do you can want I to build comment on, on I that? I want to build on this point about comparative advantage because Michael touched on something very important. So I, I also agree that I think there are some, you know, part of the concept of comparative advantage is comparative political advantage. Like if you can get significant resources and bipartisan political support for health, education, efforts to end child death, child hunger. We should be doing that aggressively, in my mind, and, and driving more and more political and, and real dollars and energy into our uh, aid agency and into our system to execute on that goal. Uh, so in that construct, I think there are two unique areas of comparative advantage for the United States that we tend not to talk as much about. One is what Michael just said around democracy promotion. I would call it maybe democratic process development, mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, in a different context, but, but you know, you don't really see the multilaterals doing a particularly engaged job of supporting civil society, of, right. of building those institutions. Right. It is uh, as someone who has uh, seen it both ways in, in congressional reaction, it is a challenging task to execute, but it is so much a part of our national character and our politics that it ought to be, in my view, a big part of our foreign assistance, so it even, would be bloody, even when it's tough. It would tough. be awfully hard to show results. So I mean, it is difficult. It is difficult, it is difficult to show results in the in that construct. On the other hand, uh, we know, you know, and I don't like using this phrase, but you do kind of know it when you see it, and and you know that U.S. investments and democratic participation in the former Soviet states over a long period of time seeded a set of civil society organizations that have done extraordinary things for, for 15 years. Not always successfully, you know, but, mm -hmm. but without them you'd have even less a basis of uh, democratic engagement. That's one area. There's a second area of, of comparative advantage that we're not talking about but I think is actually the key to success over the next 15 years. And that is our engagement in fragile states around the world. And this is really important because I think there's a big misnomer around U.S. engagement in these places and a lack of understanding of the relative weakness of multilateral institution engagement in these areas. But if you go to Somalia, when you go to Afghanistan, as you look at Libya in the context of uh, in and around Syria, because so much of our foreign assistance is defined by humanitarian priority, and frankly, because so much of our national presence in places also is defined by our security perspectives, the United States has, is the, on a relative basis, we have more of our aid, assistance, and engagement in really tough, poorly governed, fragile states where there's a lot of conflict. 15 years ago, that was considered a bad thing, right? We would sit in this room, maybe not as nice a room, uh, and we would say, well, the CPIAA at the World Bank and the MCC criteria are the state of the art. And David Dollar's work from the 90s defines what effective aid looks like. We should move our resources to well-governed policy environments. Great. That was good for the last 15 years. For the next 15 years, if we care about the mission we write about in the book, ending extreme poverty, that battle is going to be fought in fragile, poorly governed, conflict-ridden states. And I think the United States far and away leads the world in the capacity to address that. Now, I don't think we're taking advantage of our leadership position nearly as effectively as we should, but it is going to be an increasing area of comparative advantage over the next decade. Yeah, I mean, I think the emphasis you put in the essay indirectly is very much on <clears throat> this blurry line between, uh, particularly in the harshest settings, as you call them, between humanitarian and what we call development. But I think with one exception, Raj, and maybe you could go to this on the programs like Power Africa, what you're saying is that the U.S. is not really good at what some people would got, what I would think of as the long-term development, having sort of a low discount rate if you're an economist, long-term investments in working with country governments so that they become more capable and more responsive, more democratic in some sense. What it's better at is dealing with people's needs uh, in the short run, which is a kind of investment in the long term. I wouldn't disagree with that when you have more, less infant mortality and more children in school, you are making a long-term investment. And that's okay, that's the question. So let me go to the other comparative advantage that you brought out at USAID, which is sort of different, which is this business of the US bringing its convening power, its technical capacity, its entrepreneurial savvy, uh, to a program like Power Africa, where it's not bringing mostly money, just a little bit to grease the wheels and get the conversation going, but it's bringing this combination of let's get everybody together, government decides it's gonna do these reforms to attract private investment, there's gonna be this amount of this and that. 
and it's a cause similar on Feed the Future, but I think much less clear and well developed so far. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the politics behind Power Africa? Congress likes that too. I believe, thanks to including some good work of colleagues here at CGD, that there's just been a reauthorization to electrify Africa. So well, just a quick view of yeah. sort of the way Michael did on the politics of PEPFAR. Yeah. Well, in, in, in much the same way, Power Africa came out of the fact that as President Obama was meeting leaders, in particular from Africa, uh, they would all say that the first and highest priority issue they needed help with was bringing low-cost, sustainable electricity to their economies so businesses could flourish and employment could move people out of poverty and sustain growth. In fact, we see, as, as you guys have written about here at CGD very well, uh, that power, even across so many MCC compacts and, and so many other uh, country analyses, has been the core constraint to growth in country after country after country, particularly in Africa. So, uh, so that, that was the sort of political origins of it. It came from the president's reactions to engagements with leaders. Um, and then Mike Froman, myself, Elizabeth Littlefield, a number of others came together to help Gail Smith help build uh, the concept of the program. I think what was unique about Power Africa, what remains unique, is the idea that we can work across institutional lines and, uh, and inside do the U.S. inside the U.S. government and do exactly what you said. So I led the effort of kind of negotiating with country leaders the regulatory frameworks and the institutional changes that would need to be made. I being USA led that piece of it. Uh, OPIC, I think, has put the most actual concessional finance into actual investment projects. Uh, there's an interagency committee that, that reviews uh, investor proposals and determines how to rank and then bring diplomatic and uh, concessional finance and other forms of support. And the Department of Energy has participated in providing some technical assistance to improve intermittency issues on the Kenyan grid, for example, to mm -hmm. take, to take uh, wind power. So that concept, I think, was very important and is not unlike the way Mike described PEPFAR um, as growing out of a White House priority. The final thing I'll say is just Congress obviously passed the Electrify Africa bill, which shows strong bipartisan support. It's great that Ed Royce played such a strong leadership role. Uh, I was disappointed that the OPEC reauthorization was not in the bill. And I do think, you know, the future of development in the context of things like power and food is very much about marrying public and private investment. And whether it's the Development Credit Authority at USAID that we took from about $300 million a year in credit guarantees to $3 billion a year in credit guarantees, or OPEC's new capabilities in this space, I think we should be doing more to bring that into the picture. Mm -hmm. I do think the controversy over OPEC is absurd. Um, I mean, given what it does. I, I do want to point out the pleasing irony of the fact that uh, President Bush was identified with free market policies, pursued a large you know, program <laughs> right that uh, uh, you know, top-down command and control program, and then President Obama you know, found innovative ways to leverage private financing on kind of important goals. I, I like that, <laughs> That's that, that irony. Yeah. I think it really it worked. But it also points to something important that we talk about in the chapter, that there are new actors in this space um, that have emerged as major players. You know, private foundations like the Gates Foundation, this is just new. And the priorities they bring, you know, on Feed the Future, for example, played an important role in, uh, in calling attention to that set of issues. Religious institutions are taking on bigger roles here. We talk, we talk about uh, the Saddleback community um, uh, taking on the, the role or goal of adopting all of the orphans in Rwanda. Um, you know, this is a pretty extraordinary thing that you would not have seen before. And then you have corporate, uh, you know, responsible corporations that are now much more oriented towards the health of their own workers and then broader, right. you know, health issues and, uh, you know, I think are playing a, an important role. So I think the Obama administration very effectively recognized and is really catalyzed uh, the role of other institutions. In, in these programs, particularly in a constrained budget environment sometimes, just to be honest. 
you know, you have to be creative when you're uh, not dealing with vast new amounts of money. And I think the administration has been very creative in that space. Nancy, because I cannot resist from your opening comment, I'd like to point out uh, I was. A You're guest. not going to talk about Pakistan. No, no, no. I will if you want me to. <laughs> no. I, I was in the UK last week, and I had the chance to uh, attend Prime Minister's Questions as the guest of, uh, of oh, Andrew, Andrew Mitchell, uh, and it was a nice day because Justine Greening, who is uh, our uh, the Minister of uh, Development there, was doing the kind of warm up uh, Q and A. And, and it was the day after, uh, I think, they had passed their version of Power Africa, which is called Electrify Africa. And I just share that to suggest that, to my original point, like when America leads, when we are innovative, when we construct programs that bring public and private together, and when we deliver results, I think sometimes our colleagues across the pond follow. Uh-huh, very good. Well done, Raj. Well done. You raised it early, so <laughs> He's I... a politician. All right, let me ask one last uh, question of each of you, and let's make it about the future. Um, here we are at CGD. We've put out a publication called The White House and the World, a briefing book for the next president. Uh, it has, I don't know, more than a dozen very concrete, specific policy proposals, including one about OPIC, giving it more credit authority and giving it an equity <laughs> instrument and so on. Um, and we have issue, you know, pieces on climate and migration and a whole range of areas that go beyond uh, foreign assistance per se. But staying a little bit with foreign assistance and the capacity of the US, if you were Michael, an advisor in the next White House. Which is not likely, but <laughs> <laughs> the Trump administration. <laughs> if you were, and you know, let's hope you are, right? At least uh, on the Republican side, let's hope that it's a, if it's a Republican president, it's one that you would want to be advising. <laughs> He is on record as clear that there are some that he wouldn't want to. Would you, you know, would you press for an initiative? Uh, and we've been talking about initiatives here. Uh, or would you press for some sort of larger change in the, the architecture of the kind that was tried in the Bush administration? Uh, in fact, I forgot to say when you were talking about it, there's a wonderful book by Carol Lancaster, who was an original board member, well known to many of you. Raj is now at the School of Foreign Service. Uh, she wrote a book that CGD published called President George's Foreign Aid, something like that. Um, Transformation or Chaos? And the chaos referred to the idea that there were these initiatives, mm -hmm. you know, that were dependent on leadership from the White House, which is something that's come out quite well from the overall discussion. So would it be an initiative? What would it be? Or would it be something somehow broader than going back to you know one of my favorite things to bash on about that isn't going anywhere, which is let's have cabinet level mm -hmm. uh, secretary for development? Well, I guess I would partially dispute the premise of the question. Um, <laughs> That's you know. always a clever way to proceed. <laughs> 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 you look after World War II when we started to solidify institutions, the post-war institutions, IMF, World Bank in the aftermath there, global economic institutions. Um, I think we're in that kind of period. I don't think we're in a chaotic period. I think we've had the development of institutions, PEPFAR, PMI, the Global Fund, Gavi, MCC. These are strong institutions that now have gone across two administrations. Um, <laughs> bipartisan support on Capitol Hill, and provide the infrastructure, I think, of a very serious outreach, you know, towards, you know, a goal-oriented uh, foreign Results assist. Driven. So right. would you want to have continuity in those, or do you have another initiative? I think that when you uh, are, are, are president, I hope the next president picks big goals, and there are a couple of them that are out there now. Um, you know, something like malaria eradication, 
which um, uh, you know Bill Gates talks about, right. or the end of extreme poverty, which is uh, you know which Raj uh, was talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. Or you know, or the uh, end of mother-to-child transmission, or um, mm -hmm. you know, there are some things to do on something the, on people the can wrap their heads. Around. Exactly. I think that that's useful, particularly when you then um, uh, wrap it in the context of institutions that can adjust and are mm. are nimble. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say, you know. I would just lay out that uh, PEPFAR is a good example, not just because it's a presidential initiative. Um, it's a good example because it's gone through at least three stages in its very short history that are pretty different. Um, you know, you had an emergency response phase where they're putting up tents and getting people on treatment, okay? You know, the theory was ready, ready fire, aim. That's mm -hmm. what Randy Tobias, you know, talked about. Then we did a reauthorization that was more oriented towards systems, and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know I think that's been very useful. Um, but now we have a new head, head of PEPAR, Deb Burks, that's rigorously using aid to guide I interventions, particularly prevention interventions, to bend the curve of new infections to a sustainable level, which is going to be essential if we're ever going to turn over responsibilities to other countries. Um, and you know that's based on so the science of circumcision, early treatment, you know, the nor and the normal, uh, you know, condom, consistent condom use, if you're preventing mother-to-child transmission. And it's a flood the zone emphasis on the regions and groups that have the highest incidence of new infection in order to get down the, mm -hmm. the, the curve of new infections. Now, this is not a very old program. It's gone through three significant mm -hmm. changes. So from initiative yeah. to institutions, that's yeah. what you're saying in a way. I, I, I think that's fair, so, and I think there's some good examples of institutions that have adjusted very well. Okay, Raj? Well, I, So initiative <coughs> to institute, what's the, is there a new initiative up your sleeve if you were to be return as administrator, it's not unheard of. Well, not uh, unimaginable. It's not going to be me. <laughs> it changes that uh, trajectory. Uh, I, I think whether it's a Republican or a Democratic president, the next president inherits kind of two fundamental realities that have that are different from what we've seen in the past few decades. The first is we will need to intensify intensify seriously our engagement in fragile states from both the security perspective and the perspective of bringing humanitarian and moral leadership to people who live in deep, deep vulnerability. It just so happens that that is also where the fight against extreme poverty will be most uh, importantly fought over the next decade. So I would like to see a big new initiative, institution, a reshaping of current efforts, um, a broadening of the concept of countering violent extremism, which as you saw was, uh, the President proposed some significant billions of dollars of extra financing for uh, in the budget, and a, and a deeper integration with international institutions that are also struggling oh, yeah. with figuring out how to do this. Uh, you know, going to donor conferences and making pledges to trust funds that then don't have any operational capability in Somalia and Yemen and Afghanistan and uh, parts of Pakistan. That sounds good and provides some political cover. It's not a solution to the task at hand. So I would like to see a rebalancing from security to a broader frame that embraces development, embraces humanitarian priorities, and embraces the capacity now to use technology to visualize what's going on in these settings in a fundamentally different way, and a big initiative around fragile states that's all-encompassing, well-funded, reshapes some institutions along the way and embraces our multilateral partners to do that in, in a fundamentally more aggressive way. And I think that's how America can best support the fight to end extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. I also believe the other big shift in the global landscape is for the first time in a long time, we're, we're in a very low yield uh, economy for much of the rest of the world. and. You know, if we're expecting slow growth in lots of different places, and we're seeing big institutions in Japan and elsewhere actually now providing kind of negative interest rates on savings, we should be using this moment in time to drive more investment into poorer countries that are still growing at 7 or 8 or 9%. And that is the Ethiopias and the Tanzanias and the Ghanas and the Indias and elsewhere in the world. So I'd like to see all the things you mentioned 
around OPIC, but, but also a, a broader way to reach out to American investors and institutions, uh, give OPIC equity authority, provide more uh, capacity for the sort of leadership we showed with, uh, with the new Alliance for Food Security and with Power Africa, and drive more and more commercial engagement into these markets. I think the time is very ripe for it because people are looking for exposure to those markets. And, uh, and the next president has an opportunity to, to, even with real financial constraints on the budget, to seize the opportunity and drive more American capital, know-how, and capability into other parts of the world that we've all focused on as developmental opportunities. OK, these are good answers. What I'm hearing is uh, stick with initiatives as long as you stick with them long enough to get them really embedded. And then from what you just said, Raj, you know, just sitting here as C in my, wearing my hat as president of CGD, I'm, I'm thinking it's good that we're worried about new models for long-term humanitarian assistance mm -hmm. in fragile and conflict settings, uh, including, you know, displaced people, <laughs> refugees that are not only the Syrians who are stuck right now in a few camps, but the m others who have been five, 10 years in refugee camps. More so, than that. 20, 25. And I'm 30. also hearing consolidate gains in a set of lower middle income, low income and lower middle income countries where governance is reasonably good. Don't, don't sort of divert, get out of those countries completely. Where perhaps, again, I'd say maybe, um, the multilateral system has a comparative advantage, but it's important for the US to have initiatives like Power Africa has been. Okay, well, I think, you know, it turned into a lot of softball questions and answers. <laughs> so now I turn to the rest of you, and maybe you'll be a little bit tougher. But they're awfully good at turning tough questions into <laughs> positive answers. <laughs> Raj, okay. over to you. Great. Firstly, everyone, let's give a round of applause to all our speakers this morning. Yeah, pretty, pretty impressive. impressive. <laughs> and the great thing about CGD is that we like to add value. So you came to hear two speakers, but you're going to get three answering the question. There's a good three for two offer. Uh, so I invite questions for all our speakers, Michael, Raj, and of course, Nancy. Uh, please put your hands up. Uh, we have a couple of our colleagues who are going around with microphones who will uh, come to you if I pick upon you. Uh, I'd invite you to stand up, say your name, your affiliation, and then a brief question would be great to our speakers, please. I'll take one from each section as we go. Let's start with this lady in the green sweater here, and then we'll go to this lady in the red over there, and then that gentleman <laughs> over there in the brown sweater. I'll take some questions, three questions first, then we'll put them to our panelists. Thank you. This was fantastic. My name is Mariam Janani. Um, I'm a consultant at Dahlberg Global Development Advisors. And you mentioned that data collection is very difficult. In many of these countries, UNICEF's data collection is antiquated. Um, yet there is this push for results-based financing, which relies on correct collection of outputs and outcomes. So how is the development community, and particularly USAID, going to close this gap in data collection, as well as adopt uh, these results-based financing mechanisms that can drive for, for better results. And, and then the next 10 years, what do you think is going to be the size of these innovative financing models? Thank you. OK, great. Thank you. And admirably concise. I like that. Let's set a model. Microphone coming to you over here. Thank you. I'm Cinnamon Dornsife. I'm at Johns Hopkins SICE. And this question is for Nancy, but I appreciate the perspectives of others as well. You know, you mentioned about comparative advantage, about US foreign aid and foreign policy. Nancy, you also alluded to the MDBs, the multilateral development banks, having relative comparative advantage in delivery of things like roads, infrastructure, maybe investments in middle-income countries with relatively good governance. So when you think about the US having such a large shareholding at all those MDBs, wouldn't it be a comparative advantage of US foreign aid to leverage that kind of assistance through the MDBs, <laughs> whether a large shareholder, and then really focus on Nancy's, Raj, your recommendations, um, and then Mike, yours, for American foreign policy? Thanks. Okay. Great, thank you. And then gentleman in the brown sweater. Microphone on your right. 
Uh, Ken Meyer, Cord World Docs. Uh, one of the most successful public health programs in the world, both domestically and internationally, is the Cuban Health Service, which domestically has achieved an infant mortality rate lower than ours, and internationally has provided thousands of doctors to the poorest of the poor, while we strip the third world of many of its doctors. Do you think we have anything to learn from the Cuban foreign aid program? Okay, interesting questions there. Okay, panel, let's start with the first one about data collection. This feels like a bit of an easy hit. Let's start with that one, shall we? Um, how is the USAID, particularly in the development community, going to close the gap in data collection and adopt results-based outcomes? Raj, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, Raj. Can I... Well, you know, if you want something controversial, I'll just I, this is where I think our kind of the stranglehold that the contracting community sometimes has on American aid instruments makes it hard to be modern. Uh, but we spend huge amounts of money on survey and uh, other forms of traditional data collection. In a program like Feed the Future, by the way, we've done it to a level of excellence that's extraordinary. And if you look at what data came out of uh, stunting reductions in Ethiopia over four or five years and the validity of that data because of the early baseline studies, uh, I'm really proud of that team. Uh, some of whom are here that help that help deliver that uh, that result, but our capacity to pivot quickly to embrace new technologies like using SMS-based data collection or visual photographic-based data collection that's crowdsourced or satellite imagery that the polio eradication use so uh, initiative used so effectively in northern Nigeria to conduct the first real census of northern Nigeria, identify which villages were not getting polio vaccinators and then sending Rotarians out to those places, uh, which ultimately helped a lot when we were fighting Ebola in that same context. Uh, it, we are way too slow to pivot to these new technologies, and we're still using a mindset that is, let's do a manual survey data, send people out with clipboards, or now maybe send people out with electronic clipboards, and, uh, and then collect the data years later and see what happened as opposed to this real-time data mindset. And I'd love to see a few hundred million dollars shift from the structures that are sort of highly vested in that survey mindset to the more Silicon Valley-oriented real-time data people. Uh, but executing that kind of shift requires taking on a lot of entrenched interests, uh, which we tried to do and, and did successfully in some contexts, but it's tough. Let, let me give a... I think it's complementary, but it's quite a different answer. I think the data issue for developing countries has to be put more in the hands of the developing countries. And that the, the, the international community that does aid of various forms has simply been bad about providing support to, say, the Department of Statistics in every country in Africa. And what we know from a report done by colleagues here at CGD, it refers to the data revolution, is that in fact the international community is often you know, creating incentives for people in the Department of Statistics to do the surveys that USAID needs or the World Bank needs to verify or um, reaffirm somehow a program that it's doing. So, it's one way to think of the difference between an initiative-driven data con collection and institution building that is going to stick for the long run. Um, I can't stop thinking that it's a good moment to mention there is this Gordon Brown Commission on Financing Education. And we're working very hard at CGD. We're one of many groups uh, advising and working on background stuff for this commission that if the donors would really pay for outcomes, simple outcomes, in countries that have institutional capacity to get their own act together to drive toward a, a simple outcome, like children are learning something in school, that's our favorite, then there would be country level incentives to measure those outcomes in order to collect their payments. We call it cash on delivery aid, others call it results-based aid, there are many names for it, but the simpler and the more transparent and the more focused on a particular outcome that has to be measured and then independently verified, the faster we'll get country-level incentives right 
for governments themselves to be doing the public good that is about measuring, collecting and measuring and using data and having it feed back into their own policy and program decisions. Michael. Yeah, can I add one, just one thing to that? Um, I think data is essential. I think we need to be building into the programs. We need to find ways to actually, put, you know, what in my experience of government, parts of government gain information. The question of how you turn information into policy across the government is a very interesting one, I think. Um, and um, so I'm for all of that, but I would just add that there's no substitute for political leadership on some of these goals. Um, you know, on failed and fragile states, we are not going to have that same, you know, level of data. Um, or may, at least now. I, I don't, I'm not sure our policy is even very developed in that area. Mm. Um, this is a tough, right? this is a big yeah. challenge for the next administration. Right. And that is going to take essentially a set of political arguments that have to do with long-term threats to America and, you know, the future of poverty and all those things that you're talking about. And so, you know, I'd put that in that category. And we always had a much tougher time, even in, when it's results-oriented, selling, you know, long-term development right. like it's MCC um, compared to, you know, categorical sort of programs on health. Right. Um, right. So there's a built-in bias in some of this that does take some leadership to overcome, depending on what your mix of priorities is. Right. Okay. So a quick note on Cinnamon's question. Um, you know, I mentioned this factoid that the U.S. every year makes greater contributions to global health programs than to uh, the soft window at the IDB, at the uh, World Bank and the other banks probably, uh, which deal with, among other things, fragile and harsh environments. And Raj is great, you know. He used it to emphasize how great we're doing uh, as a country in, in global health. What I had in mind, actually, is there's greater leverage when resources go to the multilateral banks, greater leverage of US money through the multilateral banks, both because the US contributions leverage other countries' contributions. That's the way the setup is at the moment, and because now, more and more, uh, at the Asian Development Bank, for example, even the soft contributions will go into the capital base and they will leverage multiple times um, those resources through the, the way the borrowing, the, the credit union factor works. So I think it's a really good question, and I hope that uh, the equivalent of Michael Gerson in the White House in the next presidency is a champion of somewhat more use, uh, channeling of foreign aid funds appropriated by the US Congress to the multilateral system, as long as that also means you know, effective US role in, a genera in influence and voice in those systems, which we have, actually. So it may interest you that I think the U.S. puts about 12 or 13 percent of its resources to the multilateral or global programs, and the U.K. something like 25, 30 percent. I might have the numbers wrong, but it's that order of difference. So it's a good question. I think Raj has to do the Cuban health service. <laughs> He's the doctor in the room. Uh, well, we, you know, we we work closely with the Cuban. Uh, health service to put Cuban physicians in West Africa during the Ebola response when it was hard to get other others to participate. And then we uh, created a housing solution for them and actually integrated them into the response that we built and, and led in that context. So, and offered American military personnel services uh, through specialized facilities that we had created in Liberia in particular, should they have needed it if any of them got sick, which was a major part of getting them there. Clever. I think it is important we learn from uh, all countries and work with all countries to tackle crises. And I think you'll see a lot more of that going forward. Um, I mean, we could have a whole seminar on the Cuban health system and describe its strengths and its weaknesses. But it is difficult to, I think, conclude that that system is a better or less good system than the one we have in the United States for domestic population without at least some discussion and debate. I'll add one thing on, on that point. I've had the experience of being out in the field 
I was in uh, northern Namibia near the Angola border at a Lutheran hospital. They had three Cuban doctors who like fled when I came as an American official. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I saw that in a number of places. And they, d they know how to do global health diplomacy. Okay? And we now have an ambassador for global health diplomacy in the US government. Um, it's an office that has Struggled. looked for a role. Um, but I think that there is a role actually there in, in educating our, uh, you know, people in, at, in foreign, the Foreign Service and in the broader government about how we relate with other countries through the goal of health, which is what we do in many places. And so, uh, you know, the Cubans are, are good at that, but, you know, we're everywhere on health too. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and sometimes we don't know this, as I said, this did not come as a strategic direction to some extent. Um, but, it, uh, uh, but I think we're processing what that means in the, in the government. And so the next administration, I think, could put more emphasis on this office of global health diplomacy and, and you know, make something of it. Uh -huh. All right. Well, we have to put that on record when the time comes. Right. More questions. Let's get some more questions from everybody. Let's start with the gentleman at the back in the blue shirt. Then we'll have this lady here with the green scarf. And then with someone on this side to ask a question. Let's get the lady at the back there, also with a green scarf. Hi, I'm green Gary, scarf Mer theme. Gary Merritt, um, <clears throat> USAID, retired, public health. I'd like to uh, understand better your, your thinking about uh, whether there can be sustainable uh, reductions in poverty without an accent on human fertility reduction. It's a, such a sensitive. Um, Taking you up, Nancy, on the challenge, uh, the challenging question uh, possibility. It's hard for me to Im imagine, from an ecologic perspective, how sustainable poverty reduction can come about without significant reduction in human fertility. Okay. Thank you very much. This question can have that. Uh, I'm Ellen Frost, East West Center. I'm on the board of Relief International, but I'm not representing that organization. I'd like to push all three of you to be a little more specific about a problem all three of you raised, namely the bureaucratic and operational gap between humanitarian crisis-oriented aid on the one hand and uh, development on the other. Um, if you are talking the grants from OFDA or state PRM, they're often 12 months or even six months whereas the development-oriented uh, programs tend to be longer. And some things fall through the cracks. I just visited the two main refugee camps in Syria for Syrian refugees. And remedial education, not just education, but remedial education is a huge problem for children that have been out of school, some of them traumatized and needing psychological help and so forth. Uh, and uh, I know this is an old bureaucratic issue, but I wondered if you have any hope <laughs> that it can be that the gap can be improved and that we that our holistic approach to aid could be reflected in in our architecture thank, thank you. you and there's a lady at the back over there is there a microphone coming towards you thank you thank you so much fascinating discussion yindra check on valuing voices so i aid has done amazing work around really revitalizing and putting legs on the program cycle you know, CGD has done terrific work in terms of, you know, really looking at sustainable development goals and things like that. One of the things our research has found in my organization is that 99% of the time we do not go back post-project. We have absolutely no idea about the sustainability after our funding ends. That's a contracting issue, right? So we do marvelous work while we're there. Triple IE on impact evaluation really looks at the impact of our activities, our interventions. But nobody goes back to look at the sustained capacity of the countries to continue to maintain the activities, the outcomes of the millions of dollars that we've invested. And so little handover work ex post is, is ever really, you know, um, we don't learn about it. We don't know how to go about programming particularly well for that. So what will it take within donors, <laughs> multilaterals, work with our countries, as Nancy said, to really make this self-sustaining? What will it take to change this? Thank you very much. OK, that's actually a good question to start with. Nancy, why don't you take that on first of all? What's it going to take to make donors, countries, make evaluation of projects self-sustaining, actually really ingrain it in the culture? 
something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about here. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking when you were asking the question, the World Bank and the multilaterals actually have these departments for independent evaluation. They're variously independent, depending on time and place. Uh, and they do studies, say, of what's been the role of the World Bank. I'll use an example I'm familiar with because I've participated in it. In the last 10 years on helping pa uh, pa Pakistan deal with social, pro reduce poverty. And so there is an effort. The problem is that the inputs to that tend to be project by project. Was it effective? But the, the question of whether it's being sustained ex post is there. It is answered, at least in principle, by an evaluator after the fact for every project. So there's that effort. And you can go and read all about it. I think you're just asking a very good question. And then the answer is how to make those kinds of efforts more transparent, more clear, more disseminated, and, and, and ensure that the results of those are built into the next round of lending or concessional aid. So I mean, let me just ask Raj if that kind that's expensive and you know complicated. Uh, I was working on what did the World Bank do in Pakistan from 1990 to 2000 or 1993 to 2003, and a lot of the answers were eh, not so great. You know, a lot of money, but not clear what happened. I don't even know if the bilaterals have this kind of periodic overviews for a whole country program or for an entire sectoral program over five or 10 years? Well, I'm more familiar with it over the sectoral programs. But uh, if you look, for example, first, a good question. If you look at, uh, I'd, I'd ask you to look at Chris Holmes's work at USAID on the water and sanitation policy, because I think that's the first uh, big new policy framework that had a very specific requirement for a look back uh, m and set of investments and activities that would take place years after a program concluded. Um, and frankly, I think a lot of us would like to see a lot more of that across the board. Uh, the, the, the technology is really important here because we have in our mind that this has to be a very expensive proposition. But in reality, with modern tools and technology, if we were using it well, which we're not, uh, we could do this much, much, much more cheaply than I think is imagined. It's a great question. And maybe one of the issues is, what's the right baseline data for you know, thinking about, say, a country's, the multiple inputs for a country over 10 years? <laughs> what, what, what do you say ex ante you're hoping to accomplish? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a good question. And USAID under Raj instituted a really, really fine evaluation policy that said things like, you know, we will spend 3%. It will be done for every project over X millions. So your question inspires me to say that we should go back and take a very close look at CGD, at how much of that has actually happened and what, how is it fed back, mm -hmm. if at all, into results. It's early, though. That's, a, yeah. that's the issue. Michael, did you want to come in on that? Um, I'm happy to comment on the fertility argument. Go if for that's, it. If that's OK. Um, we, we actually addressed some of this in, yeah, in, in the, the chapter, in, the chapter, yeah. chapter yeah. In, a, in a kind of maybe controversial way. But um, the whole idea, both of population control as development policy and the introduction of abortion into that debate, is uh, uh, it's, these are very interesting arguments. Um, but they're also highly destructive to this coalition, essentially the PEPFAR coalition, that has allowed extraordinary things to take place. Um, I think on the, on, on the population side that you can make very good arguments that relate to child spacing and um, maternal health. Um, but uh, when it comes to um, you know, the center of those arguments, um, we argue that you know, we have probably different views on this. Um, but PEPFAR initially uh, survived legislatively because it didn't address those issues. Um, and uh, it, the entire thing could have blown up over those matters. Um, 
So, so I have, a, I have the same point I would make, but differently. Uh, if, so I think we all recognize that total fertility rates must be reduced uh, as part of a developmental pathway. You cannot have a Yemen with a TFR of 6.8 or whatever and consider that a sustainable path forward. We also know the drivers of TFR reduction include contraceptive prevalence as well as under five child mortality coming down. Um, and if you look at Hans Rosling's presentations and analysis, you see that often it's the under five mortality that comes down first, and then that then drives down uh, the TFR because people choose to have fewer children when they have a greater sense their children will survive and when they have a greater investment in those children thriving through school and elsewhere. That's proven statistically across you know, hundreds of studies in dozens of countries uh, analyzed. Now, in the chapter, we make the following point. At, during my tenure at USAID, we took voluntary family planning from somewhere around 400 something million to closer to 700 million per year on a bipartisan basis throughout that time frame. And part of how we were able to get there is I spoke to Republican leaders in the House and Senate and assured them that I would be rigorous in implementation of the, uh, the Hyde Amendment. Is it Hyde or is mm -hmm. it the other? Uh, it's Hyde, right, on, on abortion? Yeah, so. yeah, it's Hyde. And to me, that's the trade-off. There are plenty of people inside this administration and on the more liberal side of the Congress that would like to say, boy, if a young girl is uh, raped in a, in a camp as a refugee somewhere, America should pay for that young girl's abortion. And I could make a moral argument that that's a very reasonable and appropriate position to take. And my personal belief uh, you know, may allow for that. But in reality, if we start watering down that amendment, in my view, we will lose the strong bipartisan support we have had for voluntary family planning. And in voluntary family planning, America has been the global leader in investments, in results, in transitioning programs to host countries, uh, and many others have followed. And, and in my view, that's the right political balance uh, in order to honor the argument, uh, but also recognize that we need the political coalition. Can I say something? This is an old area of mm -hmm. expertise and passion for me. And it's, it's a question that comes up over and over again, you know, are there too many people being born? Raj gave a great answer. Uh, the way economists say that is it's endogenous to something else, the number of children people have. I think there's another issue that needs to be always raised in this context, which is we need to think of family planning the way Raj just described it. It's a service. It's, an, it's information that women should have. So not, it's not only or even mostly from the point of view of many people who care about development about reducing fertility. It may not be the answer anyway to reducing fertility if fertility is, has to do with so many other factors, high fertility. But it's a critical service and we're beginning, we're launching some research here at the center in which I hope to be involved that says the contraceptive pill itself brought about the liberation of women in many respects, including in high income countries. And it's the liberation of women that has fostered development all over the world. So that's the argument I would use for family planning. Stay away from, you know, is it about fertility reduction? And stay away from, as you have both said, the controversies that have undermined the ability to bring that information and that service to women. That's a very good point. And I think probably a good point to end because we've also run out of time. So I'm just going to invite our panelists to give me summarizing thoughts in 30 seconds each. 30 <laughs> seconds. So don't spend your time thanking everyone. <laughs> the proposition at the beginning was foreign assistance. Does the past condemn us? So just give us 30 seconds each about you know, thinking forward. What is the future of development assistance? Michael, let's start with you. 
In 30 seconds, I would say that the past doesn't condemn us because the past path indicates that this can be a refuge from the bitterness of American politics. This can be a common ground issue in American public life that's admired not just for the good that it does, which is extraordinary, but because it's a system that works, you know, a political system that supports great goals that serve America and the world with, in a bipartisan way. Um, this is possible. We've seen it's possible, and we need to move forward on it. Raj. I would add to that, I would 100% wholeheartedly agree, and I would add to that that I've seen it uh, in a personal sense in churches at Saddleback Church and in congregations in inner city Detroit where a, a very low income population living a very tough life will every week make a collection for an orphanage in Rwanda. And I've seen it in corporate boardrooms where the, the most hardcore corporate leaders uh, are willing to stretch to do things for uh, humanitarian and developmental purposes. And I have seen it on college campuses and in our military leadership. And I do think the next administration, the next president, has an opportunity to consolidate our politics across a bipartisan basis and try to reassert American investment and leadership for the purpose of ending extreme poverty. I, I think we're the most generous people on the planet, and we should embrace this as part of being an exceptional nation. And it's the politics can be stitched together, and it's been proven that it can be stitched together. But it does require a committed president to take it on as a priority. And it is an important priority because letting human opportunity speak for itself in the toughest parts of our world is our long-term moral mission, and it is the way we keep our country safe without having to put our people at great risk. OK, good thoughts. If a somewhat loose definition of 30 seconds, but never mind. Nancy, <laughs> fine. <laughs> no, I don't want to add to that. I just want to join, want all of you to join me in congratulating each of them for the leadership they've shown over the last two administrations, 16 years we're talking about in total, and to thank them for today for their eloquence and their clarity in terms of the ideas that they've planted. And we look forward to your advice uh, on how to do our best to have the same kind of progress in the next presidency that uh, you helped ensure in the last two presidencies. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Well done. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.